Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Superintendent Hoffmeister, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. I am Brooke Myler, the Executive Director of School Support. And with me today is Zeta Siri, our Grants Manager in the Office of School Support. We're really glad you've joined us today for this webinar on federal flexibility and the CARES Act. We've partnered with the Comprehensive Center Network to create this training for you. And I feel like it will be very valuable and we're looking forward to having a conversation with you today. So Zeta, if you are ready to begin, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you and good morning. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, if you would please keep your microphones muted. Um, you will receive a link to the presentation. We are recording it. And then um, as we move through this presentation, there is a lot of information. Um, but if you have questions at any time during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will get a response um, to those questions either at the end of this presentation or follow up with you um, after. If you think of any questions after the presentation is over, feel free to reach out to us via email. Let us know what those questions are so we can get those answered for you. Um, today's presentation, we're going to go over a number of things. Uh, the first is a framework for considering the work that you're doing for this time and on into the fall. The next, we'll talk about guiding principles for looking at expenditures and planning. Then we're gonna talk about the CARES Act, um, what it is and how it can be used. We'll discuss flexibilities for ongoing funding sources that you're already familiar with in addition to the CARES Act. And then finally, Brooke is going to talk to you about a rapid response planning tool that has been developed to help you during this time. So where do we even begin? As LEA administrators, this can be an overwhelming time. And this section reviews a framework for starting or continuing the work um, since that you've been doing since March. And this is a quote um, that sort of encapsulates what this time can be used for. Um, the situation is real and uncertain, but it also can provide a platform for innovative thinking and creative solutions. So now we wanna talk about guiding principles during this time. Uh, there are three main guiding principles. Um, the first is to ensure the continuity of base services. Um, this includes meals for eligible students, student support, um, and learning consistent with public health guiding, guidance. And so here you're thinking about, few, possibly thinking about food security for your low income students and families. And then consider partnering with local agencies to address those needs if you're not already doing so. The second guide, uh, guiding principle is to focus on the equitable support for students who need it most. This might look different in a distance learning environment than in the regular classroom. So you want to think about the needs of the students, um, of the needs of students that might be exacerbated at home. Um, this might still be your English uh, learner students or your special education students, but there might be other students struggling with distance learning that don't necessarily struggle when they're in the regular classroom. An example that has been provided by several of, of you all already um, is that we have students that either have one parent at home or parents or guardians are working during this time and so they don't have a person with them at home to help them with their distance learning. And the third guiding principle is to despite many unknowns, do not wait to plan. This is a new experience for all of us and taking the time to develop those plans with options for the different circumstances that may arise, it can help you to navigate um, those circumstances as they possibly arrive in the future. 
And so we're thinking about planning, not only for right now in the moment you're in, but for the summer, next fall, and more long term. So the first stage that we're in, the first phase that we're in um, is we're calling it the urgent phase. So this is the first three months. So we're looking at March, um, April, and, and May. Some of you um, are still in this right now. Some of you are, are moving to the second phase. But the objective here is to adapt learning environments to the extent possible in order to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And we'll just pull up some sample strategies here and talk about those. Um, this is the ultimate challenge right now, this urgent phase. Um, and we look at some of the sample strategies and we're talking about strategies that would engage families um, and assess needs. And the relationship between the teacher and the parent is really, really critical in this phase. Having that communication allows teachers to gauge what support that specific student might need um, during distance learning. Um, systems of connectivity and access to curriculum um, when we talk about this, we're talking about not only having access to the technology, but ensuring that everyone knows how to use it, what the expectations are, and where to get help if they need it. Um, again, strategies for uh, addressing basic needs. And finally, setting up your staff, um, your teachers, your age or specialists with all the information and resources and training that they need to be successful in this new environment. And the next phase is recovery. And so most of you are either right at the start of this phase or you're getting ready to move here. And the objective is to reflect on the learnings from the urgent phase and then lay down the groundwork for an effective school opening and initiate coordination between and among uh, school staff and local agencies. And some of the sample strategies here um, are, at, or during this phase, I'm sorry, during this phase, state officials are looking at reopening schools. Your leadership are uh, looking at when to open your schools in the fall, um, when to open a building, um, but most of that is still very uncertain at this point. The CDC and health officials are working um, on health and safety measures for reopening schools and, and what that might look like for you in the fall, but again, those are still very uncertain. And so when we look at the sample strategies, one of the ones that we wanna focus in on is establishing action teams and they can address issues beyond what is typical of a, a, a school start uh, back in the fall. Um, an example of this is that students may have had adverse childhood experiences while they were in a distance learning environment due to COVID-19. Perhaps they had a parent or family member um, get ill um, or they were put in a situation where they had to, um, you know, they weren't in their normal routine and so they had to adapt to a different routine. And having these action uh, teams in place, they can um, help identify and address the specific needs of these students as they're coming back to school in the fall. Um, next, we talk about collaborating with other organizations. Um, Again, we're looking at uh, typically mental health support services, but there can, there's a wide variety of agencies providing a wide variety of supports. And so just collaborating with them. And then we want you to look um, at your budgets. And so knowing what funding sources you have, how those funding sources can be applied, and then planning for possible budget revisions if certain circumstances arise. Finally, taking a hard look look at your continuous improvement plans and developing ways to keep your momentum while acknowledging that circumstances have changed. And the next phase is called stabilization and this is really looking at the um, 20 to 21 school year. The objective here is to focus on learning recovery and anticipate the needs of your staff, students, and families as they adapt to changes in the health guidelines.
So having a plan with options can help with any resurgence of the virus that may possibly happen in the fall. And so we're looking at ways to um, invest in resources and activities that again can support those, um, those processes in the fall. We wanna shore up those transitions, such as how students and teachers move from a classroom environment to a distance learning environment and back again. Um, we're looking at uh, making uh, those plans in writing and training people so that they are aware of the expectations and how to make those transitions more smoothly. And then we're firming up those connections with the other agencies and community partners. And the idea is if this happens again, if there is a resurgence of the virus, then everyone already knows what their roles are and it can speed up the response time and again, make those transitions uh, more smooth. This is the same with your action teams. If they're already established, they already have their plans in place of what their roles are, um, that can help speed up your response time. And finally, don't forget to include your parents and guardians in these plans. Whatever you're doing, uh, those parents and families and guardians, they all need to be aware of what the school's plans are and then what their roles are and what the expectations are on them. So what do we need? Um, this is a different question than it is for the typical start of a school year. Um, you know that you are not going to be able to do everything in the same way that you've done in the past because the landscape is different and the resources are different. So you're going to need to prioritize. So just a few notes on prioritization here. Um, you're going to start by identifying your school's values and ask what your highest values are and then do your decisions in these plans align with those values. You're gonna look at the primary services that are the foundation for how your specific school educates your student population. And then you're going to use, um, you're going to look at your funding and you're going to spend with those future goals in mind um, using those funds strategically. Again, you're going to know the funding source, how the funds can be used. Is the purchase appropriate at this time or does it need to be done later on? And are you supporting your school's improvement goals with these purchases? And finally, we want to put equity in the forefront of your decision making. So this slide here is a little bit of a flow chart to help you and your leadership team start those discussions. And this flow chart breaks down some key questions as you discuss your school's base services. Um, in your continuous improvement plan, you've identified your mission and vision statements. So here, when we talk about our first question being, what is our core mission? You can go back to that continuous improvement plan, mission and vision statement, revisit that statement and adjust it if necessary. Then we're gonna look at what your obligations are to students and families. Um, most of you probably don't have anything in your mission or vision statement about the nutritional needs of your students, and yet a service that you provide to families is feeding children. And then third, compliance. What are the federal, state, and local uh, requirements for your school? From there, you can identify the base services that the school needs to provide to meet that mission, to meet those obligations and those requirements, as well as what supports are needed uh, to ensure equitable access for all students. And then last, once you have a list of all of those services and supports, then you and your leadership team can look at what resources you already have existing at the school, what partnerships you can make with other agencies to address those needs, and then what needs you still have. So why is this important? Um, we're, 
you all are designated CSI schools and last year in your continuous improvement plan, you already started this type of thinking. You started last year with a detailed uh, needs assessment, which you then funneled into a plan that included action steps and then supported those plans with different funding streams. The concept here is the same. It's identifying the need first and then finding the funding sources. Um, this helps schools, as you already know, this helps schools plan for changes in funding. Again, your plans with the different options in them can allow for different um, funding stream levels as we move through the next year and the year after that. Um, and again, it helps keep the resources aligned with what the actual need is. So how do we get what we need right now? And here we're going to talk about the CARES Act and how it can be utilized. So the first thing we want to talk about is one-time expenses versus ongoing expenses. At this time, the CARES Act is a one-time funding source. And when we think about that, we know we are not going to want to use CARES Act funds to support ongoing continuous expenditures like teacher salaries, staff salaries, contracted services, and traditional uh, instructional coaching, or any other items that the site wants to continue year after year. Examples of one-time expenses are technology, uh, delivering materials or meals to your students, stipends for COVID-related activities outside of the contract day. And the other one that they have listed as a one-time expense that we're going to talk about right now is licenses. Um, I'm sure that some of your um, business managers and financial, uh, excuse me, federal programs managers are looking at licenses saying that's not a one-time expense. Um, so what we're talking about here is if you need to start a distance learning program um, that is an online program with the CARES Act funds, we definitely support that. We want that to happen. We want you to do that. If you're using a different online platform and you want to try a new one, the CARES Act fund is definitely a way to get that started. However, have those discussions about if your school wants to continue having those online access after, um, you know, maybe in the year after or just continuing that as an option for students. If that's the case, then you may begin with the CARES Act funds, but then have a plan in place for where to transition those costs when the CARES Act expires. And once again, the cardinal rule of one-time funds is they should not fund ongoing continuous positions. So what is the CARES Act? The Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. It's two trillion in emergency funding for states, businesses, and individuals. And this is considered a relief package, not a stimulus package for education. And the funding here is very flexible. So the Education Stabilization Fund uh, there's $30.75 billion for all states. Oklahoma will be receiving one point, excuse me, one, $161 million at the state level. Superintendent Hoffmeister released a press release on Monday with information on funding and the application process. Uh, if you did not receive this press release, um, it is available on the SDE website. So allowable uses for CARES Act funds. Um, funds are intended to be used in the following areas or on specific activities. There are 12 areas. I'm just going to read through those 12 areas. And again, if a specific question arises while I'm talking through this, please put that in the chat box so we can get that answered. 
Um, and if you think of questions later on after this presentation, please feel free to email us so that we can get you that information and that, and that answer. So area one is any activity authorized under ESSA. And so for those of you familiar with Title I, Title II, et cetera, so any activity that you are conducting with those funds would be an authorized um, activity under the CARES Act. The example here would be providing virtual tutoring for students during a low, uh, distance learning time. Area two is LEA coordination of coronavirus efforts with other public agencies. So this would support any expenditures that would come from you and your staff at your school coordinating with representatives from other agencies. And the example they give here is being on a task force um, to increase mental health services. Area three is resources to meet the needs of individual schools. So think about your specific student population and what their needs are. Um, the example here is that we might have a student population whose parents and guardians, um, a majority of the parents and guardians work in the medical industry. And so those students need additional supports because their parents are not home and available to them during um, a distance learning or a typical education day. The fourth area is activities to address the unique needs of federally recognized student subgroups. And what we're saying here is if a subgroup shows up on your report card, that's the groups we're talking about. Um, the example here is providing extra laptops and technical supports for homeless shelters if you have a large homeless student population that needs access. Area five is developing systems to improve your LEA response. If you are considering looking at um, implementing a text-based communication system to alert students and families about changing conditions, maybe help with that transition from distance learning to the classroom and back again, um, this is an area um, to, to invest those funds in. Area six is training for LEA staff on sanitation and minimizing the spread of the virus. So again, we are um, looking at any costs associated with training up your janitorial staff on how to clean the building. Number seven is purchasing cleaning supplies for your schools. So the CARES Act allows you to utilize these funds um, to purchase rubber gloves, masks, sanitizers, any cleaning supplies that you need for your school building for the upcoming year. Area eight is planning for and coordinating the continuation of base services during long-term closure. So when you're in those planning stages of the stabilization phase and you're thinking about all the different options for different circumstances that would arise, you might need someone to coordinate um, those transitions as they happen. And so the example here is hiring a short-term coordinator or paying an extra duty stipend to a staff person um, that's going to assess those needs and then coordinate those efforts for you um, whenever those transitions need to take place. Area nine is purchasing instructional technology for students. Uh, this is going to be laptops, hotspots, um, MIFIs, whatever the students, whatever your students need technology wise for doing distance learning and making those transitions in and out of the regular classroom. Area 10 is providing mental health services and support. And so um, again, these can be stipends for virtual home visits for mental health providers or other contractors that you might be working with. Area 11 is planning for and implementing summer and after school time instructional programming. Um, we've heard from several of you that you are already thinking about creative and innovative ways to reduce that summertime slide. And this is an area you can definitely invest your funds in. And so when you're thinking about those summer school programs or even after school programs for next fall, uh, CARES Act can be used to support activities like uh, going to local libraries, uh, maybe even the zoo, designing um, and implementing 
those uh, grade level appropriate activities during the summertime or in an after school setting. And number 12, we're going to make a special point of um, because um, when we talked about ongoing versus one-time visits, we said it's really not appropriate for salaries and staff. And yet category 12 or area 12 um, says activities necessary to continue services and employment of existing staff. So we want to say that this is an allowable expense, but it is not the intent of the CARES Act. And if your LEA chooses to use CARE Act, CARES Act funds for salaries, it needs to be a last resort and it needs to be as short term as possible. Um, we can talk about other ways to address budget shortfalls in the next um, section. So here we have some additional education related funding. These are the nationwide funding amounts in other education related programs. And this is useful when you are planning on which agencies you want to coordinate with and, and knowing um, the funds that they have available to them and what their programs are. Recommendations. Um, use the funds for one-time or short-term expenses that increase the quality and equity of instructional delivery during school closures. Avoid any ongoing or long-term expenditures with these funds. So how do we resource an unclear future? And so here we're gonna talk about flexibilities in other federal funding streams that you're already familiar with. Just to review, we are still talking about the same three guiding principles, continuity of basic services, equitable support, and planning. The key concepts in this section are redeployment of staff, intent and allowability of those title funds, the basics of federal fiscal flexibility, supplement, not supplant, and some national emergency waivers. So redeployment of staff, when you're in these planning um, phases with your leadership, um, you should be considering how to redeploy your skilled staff if you have to transition into a distance learning environment again. And one of the ways that you can do this is actually by mapping their skill set and their availability. And you may have an attendance officer or another staff member who has a particular routine in the brick and mortar building and that doesn't really translate well to a distance learning environment. And so by mapping what their skill set are and mapping what their availability is, you can again um, be creative and innovative in um, what that person's role looks like in a distance learning environment. Um, every school is going to be different. And so again, it's up to you and your leadership team to have these conversations and develop ways to redeploy these staffs. So we have some examples here. And these are the literacy coach creating lesson plans for small groups, um, your assistant principal leading family engagement efforts um, during those distance learning times, um, your counselor, uh, having virtual meetings as well as bus time to support students and families and then possibly um, you know your school secretary uh, is the coordinator for your transitions to and from distance learning. Intent and allowability. Um, ESSA focuses on the intent of the funds allowing more flexibility in what is actually being purchased. Um, as we all know, this is very much a change from NCLB. And this table gives you a breakdown of the various intents of the different title programs. Now, these are not all of the title programs. It's just a snapshot of some very common ones that most of you have access to. You can definitely use this chart as a tool to align your needs with the appropriate long-term funding source. So 
basics of federal fiscal flexibility, uh, which is a very difficult phrase to say fast. Um, we're going to get into those in just a moment. But before we talk about these three, please note that uh, we are discussing title funds, school improvement dollars, competitive grants that you may have like 21st century and IDEA are not included here in the state of Oklahoma. Transferability in Oklahoma's federal programs consolidated application, LEAs have the ability to transfer or to consolidate funds. And so long as you continue to meet the requirements of those programs, this might be an option to consider for funding other long-term initiatives. And then the last one is LEA discretion. And this has to do with how a district expends the funds internally. ESSA allows latitude on how um, districts disperse those funds out to sites. And so this, the LEA can determine if the sites actually receive funds and have a budget themselves, or if the services are district-wide or a combination of both. Supplement versus supplant, or supplement not supplant. Um, that's a phrase that we've all heard for a very long time. We still have this rule under ESSA. However, there is much more flexibility than in NCLB. Um, the key focus on this slide are the exceptions. And specifically, we're gonna talk about the second exception because it is the most likely to happen the second bullet point says an LEA may overcome the second presumption of supplanting if it can demonstrate with evidence that the program or activity will be eliminated due to state or local funding reductions. So when we think about this, we think that, well, we know that there will be economic circumstances as a result of the pandemic. They might happen sooner than later. They might not happen until the spring of 21 or after. But this, these economic shortfalls um, in your local funding or your state funding might produce a need um, for you as an LEA to use this exception um, in the supplement versus supplant rule. So just be aware that that ex exception does exist. Lastly, um, these are a list of emergency waivers that were put out um, by the US Department of Education. Um, they offer a tremendous amount of flexibility to LEAs for the next year. All of these fall under the CARES Act, um, which is in effect until June 2021. Oklahoma has applied for these waivers and we do have some of these waivers already. Superintendent Hoffmeister has issued press releases regarding Oklahoma's waiver requests and those approvals over the last several months. Um, and I believe those press releases um, are on the SDE website if you want to go back and look at what we've been approved for and what we're still waiting on. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Brooke so that she can go over the rapid response planning tool with you. Brooke, you're muted. I'm so sorry about that. Zeta, when you turned control over to me, I lost my bottom bar that lets me unmute myself. So I'm gonna let you click slides for me if that's okay. That is perfectly fine. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. So the Office of School Support has been working on creating a tool to help you think about all of this. And the purpose really is, is to help you not only with this current needs and the urgent stage, but to also continue to use this tool. So um, you can find this tool that we've created at the bit.ly site that's at the bottom of this slide, but I'm also gonna show you some things about it. But before we look at it, I just want to help you think about, we've had so many changes 
in the last eight weeks, the last four weeks, the next four weeks will bring more changes, the next 12 weeks will bring more changes. And so our attempt with this planning tool is for it to be something that you can use over and over again so you can continue to meet needs. So it's gonna help you look at your priorities uh, your potential areas of concern, some actions you might want to take, and then also how to monitor those so that you're sure you're really addressing those things in as a quickly as manner as possible. So Zeta, let's go to that next slide. The tool really starts with helping you just reflect on your current state. And so it asks you pretty simple questions that have really large answers. For instance, what have you been spending most of your time and attention on in the last four weeks? And you know that if you had answered this on April 1st, the answer would be very different than it would be today. And probably eight weeks from now, the answer would be different yet again. So having you constantly kind of loop back and think about what am I spending most of my time on? And then have you been able to make progress on those? And what, what concerns do you still have? What are things that you are now seeing pop up that maybe weren't before and you really do need to address those now? Okay, Zaya. Then we ask you to look at an immediate needs identification. And we've tried to identify areas that we feel like will be of continued concern to you, such as staff capacity logistics of operations, child nutrition, um, instructional supports, infrastructure, all those things that are, are on our minds now because they look different than they've looked before. And so for each one of those areas of concern, we're asking you again some simple questions that have big answers, but you need to think through some of this. What action have you taken? to address this area in the last few weeks, what still needs to be done, and what support or resources are you going to need? And after you've answered those three questions about these various areas, then you can focus on one or two areas at a time. And because this is supposed to be a rapid cycle, like a four to eight week cycle, you'll be able to get back to all the things that are of concern to you, but to have real focus on just a couple. The next thing in this rapid response tool is a place for you to plan. So to write a mini SMART goal with a very short timeline and then to think about what are the actions we need to take, who needs to take those, when do those need to happen. It's just an action plan like you've seen all of all of the action plans you've ever seen before. It's just asking you to do it a little bit quicker. Let's go to the next one. And then there's also a section on this tool that gives you, gives you some checkpoints along the way. So what actions have you taken? What progress are you making? What additional actions or changes do you need to make? And we've given you a place to have four different checkpoints. I know there's only three here, but there's another one on the, on the tool when you go to that link. And so if you were thinking about checkpointing every seven to 10 days, then you would be sure to be staying on top of your SMART goal, on top of your action plan, on top of your budgeting, and be able to move through responding very quickly to the needs that you're seeing. I just again want to say that this tool was created with the idea that you could use it over and over and over again in order to continue this kind of rapid needs assessment and moving through some of the, this unique situation that we're in and these weeks ahead that will come. Okay, Zeta. So at this point, if you have questions for me or for Zeta or about anything that's on your mind right now, if you can scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see where you can open a chat box and you can certainly type your questions in there. And as you're doing that, let me remind you that you all have school support specialists of some kind. If you're a CSI school, you have the specialist that you've been assigned to for the last year. If you're an ATSI school, you can contact that office of Kelly Otis, Leslie Schmidt, Michelle Seibolt. If you're a SIG school, you can certainly contact Sharon Morgan and Michelle Seibolt. 
or excuse me, sorry, Robin Anderson, if you're a SIG school, I jumped ahead of myself. And if you're a striving reader school, Michelle Seibolt and Sharon Morgan. Those are all people and names that you've known for a while and they are still the people to reach out to. I do want to let you know that even though we are all officing from home, our phones are still operable at the State Department. It will immediately go to voicemail and then those voicemails will come to us in the form of an email. So don't hesitate to go ahead and call the numbers at the State Department that you're used to calling um, because we will get those messages very quickly. Just don't, don't worry that we're not answering. Wait for the voicemail and then we will get it. Zeta, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Are you? Uh, yeah, I can't access it because I'm sharing my desktop. Oh, that's right. Yep, I don't see any um, questions coming into the chat right now. Okay. So let me thank you for your time today. We know how busy you are. We really appreciate you coming and listening to this information and thinking about how you might use the rapid recovery response tool. As soon as we have this recording, we will send it out to you and you'll have the slides and the recording, um, a link to the response tool, and then also just um, other areas where you can contact us if you're needing any help whatsoever. If there are no questions, we'll say good afternoon. Thank you very much.